Hello? Hey, Gwen. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you doing? Good. Good. Uh, so I suppose we should start by introducing ourselves. Uh, do you want to go first? That's a good start. Sure. Um, I'm Glenn Greenwald, and I write for Salon.com. Uh, my name is Ilya Selman. I'm a law professor at George Mason University, uh, and I blog at the Volok Conspiracy blog, uh, which is where I write together with a number of other legal scholars. Right. And I guess I should add, since some of the issues that we're going to discuss um, are relevant, that before uh, my current uh, incarnation, I was also in a past life uh, a lawyer and litigated on constitutional cases and um, similar kinds of issues to the things we're going to be discussing. So, with that out of the way, um, the first issue that we're going to talk about is Libya, the war in Libya, um, and specifically the issues that have surrounded, the controversy surrounding whether President Obama has the authority to wage war without congressional approval, and not just without congressional approval, but now even in the face of a negative vote from the House, on whether that authorization would be granted. So I've written a fair amount about this, but you know, I'm interested in, in kind of the layout of, of what your views are on these issues, and we can go from there. Um, from what I've seen of your writings, I'm not sure we differ that much. As I see it, uh, and I've written about this uh, at the Vola Conspiracy and elsewhere, I think there is two big legal issues that the war raises. One is the question you ask, can they wage war without congressional authorization? Uh, and is this in fact a war? My answer in short is it is a war and the Constitution does not allow the president to wage a conflict that qualifies as a war without congressional authorization. Uh, the second big legal issue that is raised by the Libya conflict is whether or not the administration has violated the War Powers Act uh, of 1973, which says that uh, U.S. forces cannot be involved in, uh, quote, hostilities abroad for more than 90 days without congressional authorization. Uh, I think that uh, the administration is in violation of the War Powers Act as well. I don't agree with their argument that this is not actually a case of armed hostilities. However, it's reasonable to point out that there are many legal scholars and other commentators who believe that the War Powers Act is itself unconstitutional. I don't myself share that view, but I do think they have uh, some serious arguments that we can uh, talk about if you're interested. Uh, so that's sort of my general take. I think the administration is in violation of both the Constitution and the War Powers Act. Uh, and I also think the War Powers Act itself is constitutional, although that's certainly a controversial position. Uh, what do you think, Glenn? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about the debate about the War Powers Resolution is you can find arguments that it's unconstitutional from both ends of the spectrum. You have some people who believe that it's unconstitutional to allow the president to wage a war without congressional authorization or without a declaration of war, even if Congress in advance gives this broad authority. It's an unconstitutional delegation of what's supposed to be congressional power under Article 1, Section 8. Um, alternatively, you have people who believe that it's an infringement of the President's Article 2 power as Commander-in-Chief to tie his hands by requiring congressional approval. Um, and I actually want to talk about this Article 2 um, view, because to me, you know, I mean, there's lots of legalistic arguments about the War Powers Revolution. I think legal scholars have been, I wouldn't say, nothing's unanimous, but it's certainly been the preponderance of legal scholars have not only disagreed with the, the Obama White House view of um, how they've interpreted the War Powers Resolution, but have not even been very civil to it. I mean, it's <laughs> really been the subject of lots of mockery and derision. And what's amazing, of course, is even President Obama's own Attorney General, um, the General Counsel of the Department of Defense, kind of renowned for being very um, pro-war and, and hawkish on executive power questions, and most notably the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, which is supposed to engineer and coordinate these kind of legal disputes and, and provide a way to make it objective rather than cherry picking, also have all disagreed with the President's view of the War Powers Resolution and its application. To Libya, but to me, the, the more interesting issue is this, this Article 2 notion because it really extends beyond legalism. And, and you know, so much, if you listen to foreign policy discussions um, over the past decade, especially, but even before that, there's this pervasive notion that not to me is, isn't just merely unpersuasive, but clearly false 
Uh, that Article 2, and specifically the Commander-in-Chief Clause, vests the President with this kind of broad, generalized, not just duty, but also right, um, to defend the nation. And that that means that almost anything that the President thinks needs to be done in the national defense is something that the Constitution um, ascribes to him as a power. And to me, this idea is creates so much mischief and is at the heart of so many misconceptions about how the system of government is supposed to work because if, you know, you hear people all the time, including even presidents, both Bush and Obama have said things like this. They say things like, the president's first duty as his oath of office stipulates is to protect the nation. And of course, the oath of office says nothing about protecting the nation. It says he shall defend the constitution of the United States. And the only thing in Article 2 that purports to give the president this kind of authority in military affairs or, or war, war wagering is the Commander-in-Chief Clause. Um, and the best description of the Commander-in-Chief Clause that I've ever seen comes from, um, it was written by Justice Scalia and joined by Justice Stevens in the Hamby case, or in dissent, where they basically said that the Commander-in-Chief Clause make, makes the President nothing more than the top general whenever Congress starts wars. In other words, once there's a war, you have to have a top general. The Commander-in-Chief Clause says that person, the, the one who runs the military, who prosecutes the war, is the, is the president, but the idea that he can start wars on his own or has some blunderbuss generalized power to defend the nation, um, which means he can order the military into hostilities without Congress, is something that is completely foreign to what the founders talked about and what the language says. And this idea, this Article Two idea, was of course at the heart of Bush radicalism about what his powers were and is now being increasingly invoked by democratic loyalists as well to justify the president's actions in Libya and elsewhere, do you have that kind of maximalist view or minimalist view of the Commander-in-Chief that Scalia and Stevens have, or do you see it differently? Uh, actually, this is probably another area where we agree. I have written in the past and have said so in various public debates, including actually once with John Yoo, that I don't think this broad interpretation of Article 2 is defensible. Uh, the comment about the president uh, just being the top general and admiral, that doesn't actually come originally from Scalia, it comes from Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers. Right. And among the founding right. fathers, as you probably know, Hamilton was the biggest advocate of executive power, but nonetheless he was very clear that the commander-in-chief power was simply a power to be the top member of the military, but not a power to initiate wars. Hamilton said at various times that only Congress has the power to do that. Moreover, with respect to conduct during the course of a war, Congress also has the power to regulate what the president and uh, the military does. In fact, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution includes a provision that gives Congress the power to make laws for the, quote, government and regulation of the land and naval forces. So uh, that is why Congress, for instance, can do things like enact the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is the military law which governs uh, the conduct of uniformed personnel. Uh, and I think also that means that they can do things like impose restrictions on uh, the use of particular weapons, for instance, chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, and the like. And I would also think, as I know you have written, that it gives them the power to uh, restrict the treatment of prisoners of war as well, including things like uh, interrogation techniques. Uh, now, some people, including John, you and others, have said, well, this would give Congress too much power. They could therefore micromanage the president. Uh, I think there is some risk that this can happen. I don't claim that the constitutional allocation of powers is perfect. However, the president has some important tools of his own. One is uh, any congressional regulations that micromanage too much, he can veto them, and it's not easy to get a two-thirds majority to override him. Second, uh, you know, if they over-restrict American forces during a time of war, he can uh, mobilize public opinion and claim that they are endangering American servicemen's lives, and that, too, is a powerful weapon that he has. So I don't think that my approach means that the president has only a minimal amount of power uh, or that he's some kind of wacky of Congress, as uh, one of my uh, critics pointed out suggested in a recent debate. Uh, but I do think that uh, this sort of maximalist view that Article 2 means that the president is the sole decision maker on anything having to do with waging war and national security. I don't think that fits the text of the Constitution. Uh, it does not fit the original meaning. Uh, 
uh, and it does not even fit, I think, the last 60 or 70 years of practice where uh, for the majority of large-scale conflicts, uh, the president has gone to Congress to get congressional authorization, uh, and the presidents, most of them at least, have uh, obeyed at least many congressional restrictions under conduct like the Uniform Code of Military Justice and others. There certainly have been some deviations. I think the U Torture Memo is an example, but it's not the case that, as some people claim, that the practice is unequivocally on one side here. Right. Well, I never quite understand the impact of that argument in any event, that it's been done this way repeatedly throughout the last several decades. I, I understand that that, I understand the argument, the premise. I never understand the therefore part of that statement, which seems to be therefore because it's been done in the past, it's justifiable to do it now. Um, I mean, there's probably a good case to make that we have swung too far in the direction of um, presidential assert assertions of presidential power in the war making and foreign policy context, in part because Congress probably has shied away from asserting um, its authority because it's a lot easier to let the president take the heat, in part because our political culture suggests that there's something taboo about especially competing a war that the president wants to fight. Um, but I think you're right, it's sort of exaggerated. There are only a, a few cases, certainly very few, on the level of the military engagement in Libya where the president just went ahead and waged war um, without congressional authorization. I mean, there is, the, in the, during the Clinton administration, there was actually a vote on whether or not the bombing of Kosovo should be authorized by Congress, and it passed the Senate, um, and the vote in the House was 213 to 213, which meant it failed, and the bombing continued. But even there, the Clinton administration had the argument that the Obama administration does not have here, that the Congress had authorized money, had allocated money specifically for the Kosovo military action, um, and therefore that was implicit authorization. Um, but what I find so interesting is the way that the whole political alignment has, 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 has coalesced around this issue, because for a long time it was kind of Democratic Party orthodoxy, the War Powers Resolution was an important piece of legislation, it needed to be given as expansive a reading as possible in order to prevent um, things like the Vietnam conflict from spiraling out of control to ensure that the American people through the Congress had to consent before wars could be fought. Um, conversely, it was a Republican orthodoxy, as you started out by saying that the War Powers Resolution <coughs> was unconstitutional, and, and yet now the debate over these legal issues uh, on, on Libya don't really break down along Republican or Democrat lines or left and right lines. And in fact, um, you know, the leadership of both the Republican and the Democratic parties in the, in the House um, have been pretty supportive of Obama's assertion of these powers, and what you see is the rank and file of each party, almost in equal measure, um, demanding that he comply. And of course, you know, you had, even before he was elected, when he was running for office, President Obama was asked specifically if George Bush would have the authority to bomb Iran without congressional authorization. Um, and Obama said, uh, presidents do not have the constitutional authority to engage in unilateral military attacks on other countries unless the nation's security is directly at risk. But to me, like the, the really significant part of this whole debate, and, and the reason why I've been so interested in it and written about it so much, is not necessarily because of my views about the substance, the substance of the war in Libya. I was against it from the start. I thought the, the justifications for it were clearly pretextual, that we're going to be there a lot longer than a lot of people thought we would, that there'd be mission creep, all those things. But the, the, the concern about the legal issue is more that this idea that if, as, if we don't have boots on the ground, to use the cliche, and all we're doing is, um, you know, using drones and, and air attacks and the like, I mean, this is basically how we fight wars now. You know, there's six different countries where the Obama administration is using drones, um, and drones are definitive acts of war. I mean, they kill lots of people, they drop bombs on things, they blow things up, you know, all the traditional characteristics that we think of war are, are you know, raised by drones, and if you start entrenching the idea that merely attacking countries with drones is not really a war or even hostilities, um, you're essentially vesting the president with the unrestrained power um, to wage war for as long as he likes, for any reason that he likes, without any whiff of democratic consent or congressional authorization. To me, that's the really ominous development that this debate is, is giving rise to. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think this is a, a reasonable point. Uh, I do think we may differ a little bit on this in that I do think that there can be small-scale military actions, whether with drones or not, that are not of a scale to amount to a war. So I think a few drone attacks in Yemen, for instance, 
whether they're morally justified or not, I don't think they rise to the level of a sufficient amount of hostilities uh, to qualify as a war, even though conversely something like bombing Libya for many weeks I think does rise to that level. Uh, on balance, I, I agree with you that uh, legally and morally it shouldn't make a difference that uh, you know we're using drones as opposed to other kinds of weapons. As you say, they kill and just people or destroy uh, targets in much the same way as conventional military attacks do. Uh, at the same time, uh, I do think there are some important political constraints uh, in that uh, the public and Congress will tolerate small-scale uh, drone attacks and the like on terrorist targets uh, when they're not costly and we don't uh, take much of a risk there. On the other hand, uh, a much more large-scale engagement will raise more political problems for the president. And this one, I think, if it continues for another few months, uh, will raise some problems for him as well. In fact, it seems to me, I could be reading him wrong, but it seems to me that what he's trying to do is repeat the Clinton administration's strategy in Bosnia, where Clinton knew his political support was at best weak, and that's why he limited U.S. involvement in terms of the number of forces involved, and also in terms of exposure to the risk of casualties. And as a result, after about 70 days, when the hostilities were over, he ended up suffering relatively little political cost for what he did, even though Congress didn't like it and public opinion was deeply divided. Uh, it seemed to me that the Obama administration in Libya uh, is trying to sort of essentially repeat this performance. Uh, the concern that I have, actually I have two concerns. One is sort of the legal concerns that I stated previously. It still is a war, and it still, I think, does violate the War Powers Act, and I think it sets a, a poor precedent. Uh, secondly, uh, Clinton, in the end, was successful in achieving his uh, uh, military objectives in a relatively short period of time and stopping the genocide in Kosovo. I think you know he does deserve credit for developing a strategy that did that. It is much less clear to me that the Obama administration will be able to achieve its objectives in Libya uh, within a similar short time frame. Indeed, it's not even completely clear exactly what those objectives are and that the administration is sort of hemmed and hawed over the question of whether they actually want to remove Gaddafi or not, or whether the goal is simply to protect civilians. Uh, at various times, they've said both things. Uh, so my concern, therefore, is that even though their strategy is to imitate what happened in Kosovo, and some, to some degree at least, it's not clear whether they will be successful in doing so. Right. I mean, yeah, I don't disagree with you that you can have limited drone attacks without rising to the level of war in a way that would require a declaration under Article 1, Section 8. I do, though, think that, that once you start um, trying to kill people in a country or targeting factions within that country, um, the way we're doing in Yemen, um, on an ongoing basis, at least rises to the level of hostilities. Um, and what's interesting about the War Powers Resolution is that there are clauses in it, like the reporting clause, that are unbelievably broad, that, are, that require far less as a trigger than even hostility. Simply deploying the military in any way in those countries will trigger those um, requirements. But you know, a couple of things that I think are interesting about the Libya um, case and, and Obama, and it's interesting th that you see um, precedent in, in what Obama and what uh, Clinton tried to do in, in Bosnia, because if you, look at, if you look at what the political discourse was at the time that Obama first committed the country to military action in Libya, I think it's extremely clear that had he gone to Congress at the very beginning to seek authorization, that it would have been given without I, much, I agree. Uh, difficulty. I agree. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, you even had Republican leaders, you know, criticizing him, not for being too involved in Libya, but for not being involved aggressively enough or quickly enough. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's possible that they just didn't do it because they misread the political climate, although I think that's unlikely. I mean, I think, you know, I remember during the Bush years, there used to always be this question, why would George Bush and Dick Cheney not go to Congress and seek authorization, for instance, to get warrantless eavesdropping powers and, or, or to detain people at Guantanamo the way the, the Supreme Court in Hamdan said they needed to do, when it was obvious in the wake of 9-11 this, compli this co compliant Congress would have given them whatever war powers they wanted. Um, and the answer seemed to be pretty clear, which is that they wanted to establish the principle that they didn't need anybody's permission. They wanted to entrench broad theories of executive power um, that said they don't need the court's permission or Congress's permission to do these things, and even if Congress would have given it, they didn't want to get it. They wanted to do it without it to 
entrench these this principle, and I wonder if you think the Obama administration is operating under the same sort of hubris, that is, maybe we could have gotten Congress's approval, but we don't need it. And then just the, the, the other question I have for you, and maybe we can just have this be the last one, um, is, uh, you know, you began by saying, and I certainly agree, that what, what, what Obama is doing in waging war in Libya um, violates both the Constitution and the, the statute, the War Powers Resolution. Um, that's a pretty significant accusation to make. I mean, it's basically saying he's, he's acting unconstitutionally and illegally. Um, it's such a common accusation that it doesn't seem that significant anymore, but it actually is. So what do you think the proper remedies are? Um, they, it's pretty clear that he has no in intention to wind down the war or to withdraw U.S. participation. What do you think Congress ought to be doing or, or other agencies or branches or factions ought to be doing in the face of this uh, illegal behavior? See, you asked two good questions. Uh, I think it is a little bit of a mystery, at least to me, why the Obama administration did not go seek authorization uh, when they could probably have gotten it from Congress. Uh, I agree that there is a parallel with Bush's actions early in his administration. Uh, and there, as he said, we know what the explanation was. Uh, Bush, or at least Dick Cheney and others' administration, had this very strong view that executive power was very broad and should not be compromised in any way. Ironically, of course, they ended up damaging and discrediting executive power to some extent but by their uncompromising approach, but that was their view. In this case, uh, it's possible that there was a similar situation, but I say only possible because we don't yet know enough, I think, about what their calculations were. There, here, the issue for them was not executive power so much as the idea that the United States can and should enter certain conflicts when there has been sort of international authorization for them here by the UN Security Council and to some extent also by NATO. Uh, there are, as you know, internationalists within the Democratic Party who really believe that sort of the U.S. should follow more and engage more with international institutions, international law. And it's possible that some of those people uh, wanted to establish the principle that in a situation where we have this international authorization, that's sufficient. We don't need uh, further domestic authorization. Uh, I think this is a wrong-headed idea for various reasons. In particular, legally speaking, the Constitution does not allow us to wage war merely because the United Nations or any international entity has uh, permitted it, but there may be some people administration who had this view and saw this as an opportunity to establish it and as a precedent. That said, though, we don't, I think, yet know whether this was the real reason or whether they simply made a political miscalculation. Uh, and, of course, those two theories are not mutually exclusive. They could have both wanted to establish the principle and also miscalculated on the question of how quickly they might run into political trouble if they didn't get congressional authorization. Uh, I don't think that, you know, we, we shouldn't necessarily posit some sort of diabolical conspiracy where a simple mistake uh, could be at the bottom of it. Uh, I think Obama is a smart politician, but he does sometimes make mistakes, as, as do all presidents. Uh, now, you asked the second question, what uh, could Congress do? Just, uh, just, just, quickly on that, on that, just quickly on that last question. Sure, go ahead. Um, you know, what's interesting is that, and I think you're right, there are a lot of people in the administration who do believe that, you know, this internationalist perspective justifies and even obligates the U.S. to participate in these conflicts. Although the administration has many, many venues articulated in formal and informal ways their view as to why President Obama is legally justified in waging this war, and never once did they raise this internationalist um, position, that because NATO or the UN had authorized it, it meant that congressional authority was not um, needed, that that supplanted those requirements. It was always these very strained arguments. The, there was an OLC memo from the start that talked about the limited nat nature and, uh, and scope and duration of what the conflict was, that past precedent justified it. And then, of course, President Obama, once the 60 day was ran out, ran, you know, resorted to this very strange semantic argument about hostilities. I just think it's interesting that had they wanted to entrench that internationalist view that when the UN does it or NATO does it, you know, the president doesn't need congressional authority, um, it was just conspicuously absent in the justifications they offered. Uh, it was absent later after the fact when they began to run into problems, but initially when they made the, their case for the war, uh, this was certainly central to it. Uh, 
I think also the administration is not monolithic on these issues, and the people right. who wrote the OLC memo are not necessarily the same people who have this view. Those people, as I understand it, are more common in the State Department as opposed to in the Office of Legal Counsel and the Justice Department. Uh, right. So I think I think I, I think I think they relied on this argument to justify it on policy grounds. Um, I guess what I mean is they haven't really relied on it much, if, if at all, to justify it on legal grounds. Yeah. That's a fair point. And again, as I said, I'm not sure that that's the actual reason why they didn't go to Congress, but it certainly is a reason that has been offered by various commentators. We may not know what the actual reason was until perhaps even years from now and we get some of their internal documents declassified. Uh, I want to just very briefly answer your second question, yeah, what can yeah. Congress do? Uh, I think uh, obviously the most drastic remedy would be impeachment, uh, although I agree that what I've made is, is it is a serious accusation that he's acted unconstitutionally and illegally. I don't think it's a practical matter that impeachment is practical or even that it's desirable. Obviously, uh, there's not the votes for it, and if it did happen, it would essentially deeply divide the country uh, in a way that I think would be uh, ultimately would cause more harm than good. Uh, I think a less drastic measure would be for Congress to pass a resolution that does authorize a continuation uh, of U.S. military force in Libya, at least for some time, but also puts time limits on it and other conditions and also forces the president to clarify what the objective is. Uh, if the objective is to get rid of the Gaddafi regime, which may be a reasonable goal, then uh, the congressional resolution should state that uh, and should require uh, that uh, it be accomplished within uh, you know, some reasonable period of time. Now, I say that, like you, to maybe not to the same extent, I have some doubts about the initial policy wisdom of going in there, but I think now that we're in there, uh, even if illegally and unconstitutionally, uh, it would be a very unfortunate setback for the U.S. Uh, if we then were perceived as being defeated, it would impede uh, important efforts and interests of ours on many fronts. Uh, so even though I think the initial wisdom of this decision was questionable, I also think that it, it would be dangerous to simply say, okay, we're going to pack up and leave. Uh, quite possibly, we should not have gone in in the first place. I think that was a very close call. Uh, but I think now that the president has gone in unilaterally, you uh, unilaterally with respect to Congress, uh, he, uh, you know, that puts Congress and the rest of us in a difficult situation. Uh, if only the president's reputation was at stake, that you know that would not be a big problem for me. But what's at stake also is the reputation of the U.S. and various national interests. So I think you know it's a hard dilemma. What I mean, what do you think they should do? I I agree with you that that uh, what he's doing in violation of the Constitution of the law, theoretically speaking, is an impeachable offense, and you know it's it's a remedy that Congress could exercise. I also think it's completely impractical for a whole variety of reasons, and I don't spend any time advocating it or thinking about it because it's not going to happen. Um, and you can make an argument that it shouldn't. Um, I think the more practical remedy is to defund the war. Um, and interestingly, you know, there were two votes in the House. One was to authorize the war, and that failed. The other was to defund the war um, in part, um, and it also failed. And this got misreported as the House being sort of um, divided in this kind of schizophrenic way that they were unwilling to authorize the war, but were also unwilling to defund it. Um, in reality, that bill was put forward by the Republican leadership as a way of saving the Obama administration, because while it defunded certain parts of the war for certain functions, it actually authorized and allocated funds for other aspects of the war. Um, and there were a lot of people, especially Democrats in the House, who ended up voting against what was called a defunding measure. Uh, not because they were against defunding the board, but because they were in favor of defunding. And they decided they couldn't vote and shouldn't vote for a bill that even partially funded the war, um, in part because they would be funding a war that they opposed, but more significantly because it would give the Obama administration an argument, um, the one that I described earlier that the Clinton administration used, that by allocating any money for this war, the Congress was implicitly authorizing it. Um, and Josh Rogan in Foreign Policy reported that had it been just a clean up or down vote on pure defunding, that the votes were actually in the House um, to defund the war, although not uh, probably in the Senate. 
Um, you know, the only thing I would say about your argument about why it's dangerous for us to lose is that this was, to me, this to me is the same mindset that kind of has kept us in Afghanistan for a decade, that kept us in Iraq for as long as we've been in there and probably will continue to be there. Um, you know, and it may be true that if we were to leave Libya without having um, accomplished our stated objectives, that it would be perceived as a loss. Um, but I think that staying in a place without a very good exit strategy, um, with no clear objective, without any real ability to bring about the goals that we want um, for months after month after month, for years after years after years, um, actually does more to undermine American credibility and, and perceptions of strain um, than a quick loss does. You know, the fact that we've been dragged into Afghanistan for a full decade and, and haven't accomplished very much, um, the fact that in Iraq we were there for as long as we had and, and it was such a debacle, I think that has caused far more harm to how American strength and in, in, interests are, are perceived than had we withdrawn after a few months or, or after a year or so. Um, so, you know, I think that if you decide that the, a war is unjustly commenced um, or that it's not a wise war, um, I understand the argument that once it commences, there's added reasons to continue it, even if you were against it in the first place. But I think that that argument is often oversold and it actually undermines its own goal by, by keeping us in places where we shouldn't be and can't really accomplish much. And, and that weakens us on a military level, on an economic level, and on a perceptual level more than you know, a quick withdrawal would do. But yeah, so this would be, takes us into a much broader set of foreign policy issues. I guess all I would say is that with respect to both Iraq and Afghanistan, although I think there were severe mistakes made in both, I also think that we are better off uh, for not having simply given up early on. I think that's clearly the case uh, in Iraq when various gains were made for, since 2007. In Afghanistan, you know, perhaps remains to be seen uh, but I think, you know, it's certainly uh, feasible for us still to leave behind a regime which is much better than the one we got rid of and to also uh, cut down the Taliban to the point where they have little or no chance of regaining power. Now, it may be that those objectives were not worth the uh, cost paid for them, but I think uh, having taken them on, uh, for reasons I noted earlier, may be dangerous to... Uh, simply then uh, cut and run. Uh, that perhaps is a topic for a different uh, blogging heads broadcast or one yeah, yeah, involving probably. foreign policy experts. Uh, but, you know, I think we've both sort of stated our uh, take on that. Uh, unless you disagree, I thought we might move on to the second topic on our agenda, which is developments in the war on drugs. I read. Oh, uh, did you want to do debt limit, or do you want to do the war? Is the number two war on drugs? Or oh, I'm sorry. But, so why don't we do the? Why don't we quickly do the debt limit, and then we'll move on to the war on drugs. Sorry, I okay. uh, got it out of order. Uh, no so uh, uh, one of the hottest con uh, constitutional controversy of the last two or three weeks, at any rate, has been this debate over the uh, debt raising the debt limit, and specifically, some people have raised the argument that the refusal by Republicans in Congress to raise the debt limit violates the 14th Amendment, which says in relevant part that the public debt of the United States, quote, shall not be questioned. Uh, so the argument is that uh, if raising a debt limit is what's needed to pay off the debt, uh, then by refusing to do it, the Republicans are essentially violating the Constitution. Uh, some Democrats have also made the argument that if Republicans persist in this stance, the president could raise the debt limit uh, on his own and, in effect, borrow money on his own authority. Uh, I, I think that these are interesting arguments, but I think ultimately uh, both of them are probably wrong. Uh, a maximalist interpretation uh, of the shall not be questioned provision uh, would indeed say that uh, it's unconstitutional to do anything that might greatly increase the chance that the U.S. will fail, fail to repay its debt. Uh, but if that's true, as Lawrence Tribe has recently pointed out, uh, if that's true, then it applies not just to refusing a debt limit, to raise debt limit, it also applies to things like uh, continuing to spend money on massive entitlement programs, to spend money on wars, to spend money on almost anything. All of those expenditures raise the uh, likelihood that the U.S. at some point will not be able to pay its debts. Uh, similarly, you could, conversely, you could say failure to raise taxes uh, also has the same effect. So 
Uh, it seems, therefore, that you know everything that uh, you know that almost everything that the U.S. government has done for the last decade or two uh, is one big violation of the uh, debt limit clause under this uh, argument. Uh, I think a more reasonable, more narrow interpretation of uh, this clause would be to say that uh, it is a violation of the Constitution for the federal government to explicitly repudiate its debt, to say, okay, we're defaulting like Argentina did a few years ago, uh, but that merely increasing the risk of default, while perhaps unwise and undesirable, I certainly think it's unwise, uh, is uh, not a violation of the 14th Amendment. Yeah, I agree with, with both of those, um, with, with that view. Um, I thought Warren's Tribe's op-ed was, was very persuasive. Um, the thing that I think is interesting about th this issue and how it's played out is, I don't, you know, I don't think that when the issue was originally raised, it was intended to be a purely legalistic position. I think it was really intended to be a strategy for how the president could generate some negotiating leverage. The idea being that if he had a way to tell Republicans um, that the threat that lots of people depicted them as posing, which was we're going to make the U.S. default um, because we're not going to raise the debt ceiling unless you give us what we want, namely huge budget cuts and, and a, a broad deal to get the U.S. on firmer financial footing. Um, but it was a way for the president to say that that leverage that you think you have, you don't actually have because it would be unconstitutional for you to do that and I could actually unilaterally you know, on my own raise the debt limit. I don't need you to do it. Um, and what you saw was the White House almost immediately and pretty unequivocally say that they had no interest in this argument um, and didn't intend to raise it. Um, and I think this is really when lots of people, mostly Democrats and progressives, who had been thinking all along and arguing all along that what was happening in the debt ceiling debate was that the White House wanted to have just a clean increase of the debt ceiling without any accompanying deal. Um, and that the Republicans were basically, quote unquote, holding the president hostage. So this was the conventional wisdom among progressive commentators, um, by basically threatening him and therefore the country that if they didn't get the budget cuts that they wanted, that they would blow everything up by, by refusing to raise the debt limit. And I think it's now sunk in, in, in most circles um, that that narrative was wrong all along. Um, that the president never wanted a clean increase of the debt ceiling. Um, without an accompanying budget agreement because he's itching to have a, you know, multi-trillion dollar agreement that's bipartisan in nature um, and that reestablishes his brand that he, you know, so successfully exploited in 2008 of being this transpartisan conciliator um, where he bucks his own party and cuts Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security because of how nonpartisan and independent he is. Um, and he wants to run in 2012 as the, the leader who eliminated debt and not be the, the big spending liberal. And so, you know, a lot of these legal issues are really intended as negotiating strategy designed to offer Obama a way out of something that he didn't want to get out of. Um, and I think that's what you're seeing now in, in terms of this debt ceiling um, debate, this extremely strange drama. Um, where it's essentially Obama standing up and saying, I want to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. The Republicans just won't let me do it. Um, and so I think a lot of those legal things were, were kind of posturing. I don't think anyone took those debt limit arguments very seriously as constitutional doctrine. I could be wrong, but that's yeah. you know certainly so a read of it. Let me say two things. One is... It may be that your interpretation of administration's political strategy is correct. Certainly, I think the president probably wants to portray himself as moderate. I do think a lot of the devil here is in the details, like he's willing to accept perhaps some cuts to Medicare and Medicaid, but depending on which analyses you look at, the ones that he's willing to accept may be relatively small. Uh, second, whether or not the administration took these legal arguments seriously, certainly some uh, liberal and other legal commentators like Garrett Epps, for instance, of the Atlantic, I think did take them seriously. I think he was sincere, uh, whether, whether or not the administration was. Lastly, uh, as Lawrence Tribe pointed out in his recent exchange with the Treasury Department and Tim Geithner, various people in the Treasury Department had made some noises that the president might be able to borrow money on his own. They then retreated from those noises in response to uh, Tribe's op-ed, and I am glad that they did retreat from it. But I think if the president had gone out 
uh, and tried to borrow money on his own, or even more explicitly threatened to do so, I think that would have been a really serious development. I'm kind of glad that it was averted. Right, right. Yeah, I think, you know, just in terms of the, the second point, I mean, I think, or rather the first point, I think, you know, your view, one's view of whether or not Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security cuts are large, um, you know, all depends on sort of where you stand on the spectrum and how closely you're looking at it. So if you are, you know, sort of a, when it comes to domestic policy, if you tend to be pretty conservative and or libertarian, um, you know, I think anything other than a huge hatchet to those programs will be seen as kind of, I wouldn't say trivial, but, you know, insufficiently large. Uh, but if you're a Democrat, I mean, and this is the interesting thing, is that, you know, there aren't a lot of policy positions that you could say, it, by definition, Democrats support. I mean, Democrats, you know, when we have a two-party system, it's just necessarily true that every, each party accommodates a huge array of all kinds of different positions on a whole variety of issues. But defending sort of the New Deal and the crown jewels of the New Deal and the Great Society from any sort of cuts especially in a time of economic hardship, of exploding income inequality, massive unemployment, huge home foreclosures, all kinds of growing economic anxiety. You know, when you start talking about hundreds of billions of dollars in cuts um, or raising the eligibility age of Medicare, which Joe Lieberman proposed two months ago and immediately got denounced as cruel and horrible and, 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 and satanic by most Democrats and progressives, or it's talking about, you know, adjusting Social Security um, formula so that you reduce benefits, um, I think those are by any measure, um, you know, at least looking at it from the Democrats' perspective, um, very large. And so it's, it's, it's just strange to see a Democratic president taking the lead and even describing himself as being the instigator um, and the prime, you know, mover of making those kind of cuts impeded by the Republican Party. It's, it's just a sort of strange, disorienting political drama. I, I think it's a reasonable point, although I would note that uh, he also, in exchange for those cuts, wants about oh, $1 trillion of new taxes. I would also note that Obama is not the first Democratic president to consider uh, cuts and restrictions on Social Security and uh, Medicare. President Clinton several times came close to making a deal with the Republicans on these very same points. Yeah. Uh, and in retrospect, in retrospect, I think it's very unfortunate that they didn't strike that deal, but that's perhaps a, a topic for a, a different time. Uh, I thought uh, we might uh, move on to the next topic. We were uh, promised to talk about the war on drugs and recent developments therein, which uh, have been quite striking on several fronts. Yep, you're being a very good, vigilant, aggressive moderator, which is what we need, so <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> uh, I don't Go know if you want to start, or should I? Uh, uh, sure, I can start. Um, so, you know, um, one of, you know, I... I as you may know, and as some people watching may or may not know, um, you know, I basically live in, I live in South America, I live in Brazil, um, for the past several years, where there is an amazingly uh, fluid and progressive debate taking place about drug policy um, and the war on drugs. And, and there's lots of very uh, admired and respected former presidents and uh, political leaders of very significant stature. Um, over the past two years who have essentially come out and said that um, the war on drugs is a failure, that drug uh, criminalization policies are counterproductive and cruel, that um, the model needs to shift to one away from criminalized, the criminalized approach to a health approach and viewing drug addiction not as a crime but as a health problem. Um, and as you know, I, I uh, did a study um, in conjunction with the Cato Institute from a couple of years ago, where I went to and, and examined the one country in the world that has really systematically um, enacted drug decriminalization of all uh, substances, which is Portugal, um, and you know documented that essentially it has been a success judging by every metric. Um, and Europe too, even though they haven't moved to the level Portugal has, is is definitely in the direction of treating it as a health problem of liberalizing their drug laws and the like. Um, and you see American public opinion shifting um, in that way too when, when, when mer medical marijuana uh, referendum go before the public, um, they, they often pass. Um, public opinion polls show growing, rapidly growing support for legalizing marijuana. I think it's close to, if not at a majority. Um, 
And so you see these really encouraging trends to end what I think is one of the world's and, and the nation's greatest evils, which is um, the war on drugs. Um, and yet, just recently, in the past week, the Obama administration has issued a new policy on the drug war um, and its policy on drugs that takes about as you know militant a position in favor of a criminalized approach in the war on drugs as we've seen in quite some time, even to the point of you know really railing against what I think is should not even be a controversial policy, which is the use of medical marijuana. Um, insisting that there is no medicinal purpose to the legitimate medicinal purpose to marijuana that it ought to be criminalized um, and seeing it as sort of this gateway policy toward a full scale legalization of drugs, which this report depicts as a great evil. Um, I mean, it really systematically goes through and, and, and essentially takes the pro war on drug position in every single uh, conceivable instance with very little softening of that position, almost as though it's at odds with the growing worldwide trend. And I know you've written a lot about the war on drugs and we, I think, have very similar views about um, about the, the, the justifiability of the war, the wisdom of it, um, and the like. And I'm curious about your view, both of uh, what you think the trends are um, in terms of public opinion and public policy and the like, and, and whether you think the United States and its government is kind of consistent with those trends or, or, or resistant to them, at odds with them. Uh, so I think we do agree on this a lot. I think the war on drugs is a terrible injustice, perhaps the greatest injustice in American domestic policy in the last several decades. Uh, for those who may not know, uh, more than 55% uh, of all the people incarcerated in federal prison right now are there for nonviolent drug offenses. Uh, and uh, over 20% of all state prisons prisoners, which means that essentially nonviolent drug offenders every year. Right now, we have hundreds of thousands of people in prison for that purpose. Also, hundreds of people are killed in the United States every year because of the war on drugs, most of them either innocent or low-level drug dealers. Uh, and tens of thousands of people now in Mexico and Latin America. So this is a policy that is extremely costly in both lives uh, and uh, monetary expenditures and economic harms that it causes. Uh, I think you're right, recent trends of opinion, both in the United States and perhaps even more so abroad, have gradually been more skeptical of the war on drugs. Uh, recent surveys show that 46% of Americans uh, favor the legalization of marijuana, not just medical marijuana, marijuana in general. Uh, that's up from 12% in the early 1970s, and it's been a consistent upward trend. Uh, if you look at the question of medical marijuana, it's about 80% who favor the legalization of that. Uh, abroad, also, we've seen some important developments. Recently, the Global Commission on Drug Policy got a report stating that the war on drugs throughout the world has been a failure. It has failed to reduce drug consumption, but has cost uh, thousands of lives and huge expenditures. Uh, and this commission included lots of big wigs from all parts of the political spectrum, uh, for a former president of Brazil, uh, former Reagan Secretary of State George Shultz, uh, the Prime Minister of Greece and others. I think the report didn't say very much that was really new, but what's important is all sorts of important and prominent people, uh, more prominent than the two of us, sadly, uh, uh, have endorsed this conclusion. Uh, similarly, a British government-sponsored study reached a similar conclusion a couple months ago, uh, and that study included the participation of a number of people uh, who were very much in the conservative side of the British political spectrum. Uh, so I think opinion has certainly moved in the direction uh, of being more skeptical of the war on drugs, albeit I have to admit uh, it, it is not yet arrived at the point of favoring nearly as much legalization as I think you and I would favor. Uh, interestingly, however, the Obama administration has to some extent moved in the opposite direction. Uh, back during the 2008 campaign, uh, Obama promised that if he became president, he would end uh, federal prosecutions for medical marijuana possession and distribution in states which have legalized medical marijuana, like California and I think at least a dozen others. Uh, but then when he came into office, he first issued a memo which stopped well short of doing this, but did say, well, such prosecutions may not be a good use of uh, federal resources, that we didn't actually order them stopped. More recently, 
he has issued another memo through the Justice Department, which essentially tells U.S. attorneys, federal prosecutors, that they should, in fact, go after these cases and shouldn't feel constrained in doing so. And, of course, as you mentioned, the recent report of the administration that they just issued is very pro-war on drugs. Uh, so I certainly do not believe that uh, it's politically viable for this president or any president to favor full legalization right now, but they could at least favor medical marijuana legalization and possibly even full legalization of marijuana, uh, and also perhaps taking a somewhat less punitive and coercive approach to rest the war on drugs. So I don't expect political miracles. Uh, I try to be realistic. At the same time, I think it's unfortunate that uh, the Obama administration has not even exploited the uh, limited but very real political opportunities that do exist. Uh, and the president uh, has chosen not even to keep his own quite limited and also quite popular campaign promise from 2008 with respect to medical marijuana. Uh, so uh, I find that uh, disappointing. Uh, I don't expect miracles from politicians, but I think this is one issue where we could have seen at least more positive developments uh, than we have. Uh, given the political environment uh, that exists now, uh, where public yeah. opinion is, is more uh, willing to countenance at least some uh, legalization-like reforms than it, than it was before. Mm -hmm. A few points about that. Um, you know, first of all, I, I, I see some analog in terms of public opinion on drug policy to public opinion on gay marriage um, in the sense that, you know, like legalization of either all, you know, substances or even of marijuana. Um, it was a very short time ago that even gay marriage was unthinkable um, as a mainstream public policy. Um, you know, the most that people could hope for was civil unions, and even there, um, that was very controversial and provocative. It triggered, you know, culture wars as recently as the 2004 election, and yet now you see an unmistakable uh, trend toward gay marriage um, in places that you wouldn't expect, have expected to find it. And, and the other aspect of the public opinion that I think is similar is that, um, you know, if you look at public opinion on gay marriage, it, overwhelmingly it's, you know, people under 35 who are wildly in favor of it. Um, you know, in, in New York, for instance, there were polls that showed that I think 55 or 60 percent of New Yorkers supported the, the, the same-sex marriage bill, um, and yet some, something like 80 percent or 75 or 80 percent of people under 35 who did. Um, the same trend is, 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 is clear in, in, in terms of drug policy, where you, legalization of marijuana is favored disproportionately by young people. Presumably, that means that as the years go by, the public opinion should move greater and greater more progressively towards um, better views on drug policy. The other aspect of it is that I think that once an unthinkable position actually gets implemented somewhere, it becomes much less unthinkable, much less taboo. People see that all the horrors of it um, don't materialize. That happened with gay marriage. And I think that's what has led to more and more people um, accepting it. And I talked earlier about the, the study that I did in Portugal. Um, when Portugal decriminalized all drugs in, in, in 2000, um, it's really interesting, you know, it, it did so not because it had no problems with drugs, but for the opposite reason. Drugs were an out of control, with huge problem, and they found the more they criminalized, the worse the problem became. And when they decriminalized, they did it because this commission of apolitical experts that they convened um, recommended it, and that gave cover to the political class to be able to implement it. And at the time it was implemented, um, it was incredibly politically divisive. You had, you know, people on the right, um, attacking those who were advocating it is going to, you know, this whole parade of nightmares. They're going to turn Lisbon into um, a, a haven for drug tourism. There's going to be addicts in the street, all those kinds of things. And once people saw that none of that happened um, and they could see for themselves that the sky didn't fall in and that things actually started improving, public opinion shifted dramatically to the point where there's nobody in Portugal now just about who advocates um, a return to the, the criminalization scheme. I think that once you see some progress, incremental progress in the drug policy realm, you're going to see that kind of tipping point reach too. And that's why I agree that it's so disappointing that the Obama administration hasn't even been willing to do the few things that it easily could do. I agree. No one expected Obama to legalize all drugs or even legalize marijuana, but there's a lot he could have done that he hasn't done. The other point that I would note is that this is actually something that really surprises me, which is – 
you know, you do find some people on the right who have been pretty vocal about opposing the drug war and advocating for drug legalization. William Buckley famously did. You see, you know, libertarian politicians do it now. Ron Paul's doing it. Gary Johnson is, is doing it. Um, and yet, in reality, the drug war and, and, and criminalization, harsh criminalization policy should be one of the most important causes for Democrats and liberals and progressives. I mean, as you pointed out, not only does the war on drugs cause huge numbers of our fellow citizens to be put in cages for long periods of time um, for very little reason, um, those punishments fall overwhelmingly disproportionately on two groups, which is the racial minority, racial and ethnic minority, Blacks and Hispanics, and America, yeah, and, and Black and Hispanics, and America's poor. Um, you know, middle class and, and, and wealthy um, youth are able to, to consume drugs um, with much greater ease um, and without being arrested or punished than, than minorities and the poor are for a whole variety of reasons. I mean, it's a racist policy. It, it, it's classist. Um, it destroys families. It destroys neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, anybody who's standing up and arguing against the drug war and, and for a liberalization of policy should be cheered um, by progressives if they believe in the things that they're saying. The problem, of course, is that there's huge vested interest in having this war continue, just like the war in terror has lots of vested interest in continuing it. So there's all kinds of defense contracts and prison contracts and private prison uh, contractors who are deeply invested in the war on drugs, who want its expansion, who spend money on lobbying for it and, and the like. And so I think until public opinion not just turns more receptive, but really demands the end of these policies on economic grounds or on justice grounds, it's hard to envision real progress being made. Um, and the fact that, you know, it's still not really mainstream in either party um, to call for a, a, a meaningful reversal of it. Um, you know, you see Jim Webb doing it. You saw the Senate or the Congress take a good step um, in reducing the disparity between crack and cocaine punishment, and the Obama administration, to its credit, signed that into law. But in general, it's still not really a mainstream view. And if you look at the damage it wreaks and who the targets are, you really wonder why it isn't. Yeah, so I think I agree with most of what you said. Let me expand on a couple points. One is, I think the analogy to gay marriage is right on. What you've seen is a gradual change, which is a generational change over a period of years in terms of opinion moving in a, uh, a more liberal direction, if you like, uh, in both areas. In one of my posts, I have uh, asked the question, is this a cohort effect or is this a generational effect? Uh, that is, if it's a cohort effect, that just means maybe people like drugs when they're young, uh, when they're young or they want to get high or whatever, but then as they get older, they support uh, a more coercive policy, or is this one generation, it's different from the one that preceded it, and that generation, even as they age, they are just as uh, liberal on this. Uh, I think it's clearly a generational effect. It's not simply a case of young people uh, like legalizing drugs relatively more. It's that um, people uh, our age are more liberal on this uh, than people of the previous generation and people younger than us uh, on average are more liberal on this than, uh, than we are. I think that's a clear trend and it does point in positive uh, directions for the future. Uh, and it's been a consistent trend for about 40 years now. I mentioned that uh, in the 70s, uh, there was about 12% who favored marijuana legalization. Today, it's 46%. And you can look at this. It's not just younger people versus older. Even people aged 50 to 65, on average, those people are about 12 points more likely, uh, about 12% more favorable to legalization of marijuana than those over 65. Uh, I also agree with your other point that I think there's good reasons for both liberals and conservatives and libertarians to uh, support legalization. Uh, I do think there are a lot of libertarians and conservatives who have supported it. Uh, however, at the level of public opinion, it is unfortunately the case that uh, uh, the, the group most likely to oppose drug legalization is self-described conservatives in the recent California referendum on legalizing uh, marijuana, over 70% of self-described conservatives voted against it. Ironically, uh, I think something like 55 or 60% of the group of people who said that government is doing too much uh, voted against uh, legalizing marijuana in California. I think that's because of the large overlap uh, between this group uh, and self-described conservatives. 
Uh, and I think it's ironic that uh, and unfortunate that so many conservatives hold this view uh, because I think there are good conservative reasons uh, for uh, legalizing drugs, even if you don't believe in libertarian arguments about personal autonomy. Uh, one of those reasons is that this is a massive uh, effort at government social engineering and at suppressing a market, and one that, as I said, has been very costly and has killed many people, uh, and conservatives are, at least are supposed to be, skeptical of such efforts. Second, uh, the war on drugs as currently waged massively undermines family values uh, by imprisoning uh, a large proportion of poor black males in inner city neighborhoods. Uh, this makes it very difficult for uh, women in those communities to form stable relationships uh, and also make it greatly increase the percentage of children that essentially grow up without fathers, something that uh, conservatives have repeatedly denounced. Uh, recently, a few conservatives have begun to be more aware of this aspect of the issue. Pat Robertson, of all people, recently advocated uh, marijuana legalization, citing some of these sorts of concerns. Uh, but my hope would be that more conservatives over time would realize this problem, that if you really believe that family values is important and if we want two-parent families in poor communities, the war on drugs uh, is one of the major factors undermining that in poor communities. Yeah, and just, just one added point to that, which is, you know, one of the things that drives me kind of crazy about the drug, pol about drug policy debates is, you know, it's often the case that if you advocate for legalization, the assumption is, is that you must like drugs or want to use them, and that's the reason why you advocate legalization is though, you know, you can't advocate, you would never advocate the freedom to do X unless you yourself want to do X. Um, you know, it's not possible that you advocate freedom of speech in the pornographic realm unless you love porn, or it's not possible <laughs> that, um, you know, you, you advocate for freedom in any variety of realm, freedom of religion, unless you want to practice religion. Of course, that, that's absurd. You can have all kinds of reasons why you favor the elimination of a government prohibition on an activity without wanting to engage in it. Um, that's just obvious, and, and the war on drugs has eroded, you know, liberties. Um, it's a huge waste of money. It puts huge numbers of people in prison. But I think the key point of it is that typically what the debate often assumes that to, to legalize drugs is to trigger a massive increase in the use of drugs. And so the debate is not, is drug policy wrong? The debate is becomes, do you think it'd be better or worse to have a lot more people using drugs? Um, and the idea that drug legalization would trigger this massive increase in drug usage is, is, is really a complete myth. There's very little um, support for it. There's arguments about how, you know, there wasn't certainly this huge increase in, in drinking when, when prohibition um, ended. Um, but if you look at, for example, what happened in Portugal, and, and the reason why I, I do think it's important to look at that is because that's one of the only places where you can have, you have empirical evidence about what happens when you decriminalize or legalize as opposed to speculation, um, is that, you know, the, the argument about why they wanted to decriminalize was not this libertarian theory that it's wrong to restrict the choices of adult citizens um, or anything ethereal like that. The, the problem that they faced was that criminalization was failing to curb drug usage, and they wanted to figure out how to curb drug usage, and the answer that these experts came up with was decriminalization, that decriminalization would actually reduce addiction and reduce drug usage, and that has happened. And the reasons for it is because primarily if you stop spending some huge amounts of money um, on arresting drug users and prosecuting them and imprisoning them and, you know, buying from defense contractors, planes to interdict drug usage, all that huge waste of money, um, you can put it instead into drug counseling or methadone clinics, um, effective means of really helping people to end their addiction, which decreases drug usage. Um, additionally, if you stop telling the citizenry that you're going to arrest them and punish them um, if you catch them using drugs, which creates this sort of wall of fear between the government and the populace, um, and you tell them instead that you're going to offer them help if they want it, um, then you can have educational campaigns that are much more effective. Um, the relationship between the government and the citizenry changes for the better and becomes much more constructive. Um, and so certainly Portugal went from in the pre-decriminalization realm to being one of the worst countries in terms of drug usage and drug addiction and drug-related pathologies in the 1990s to now at the top of almost every category in the EU, way better than countries that continue harsh criminalization schemes um, for all of these reasons. So even that purely pragmatic 
premise at the center of drug policy debates, which is, well, I'm against legalization because I don't want more people using drugs, um, even that is mythological. Um, and, you know, I just think it underscores, and, and I, I often, you know, think about how generations, future generations are going to look back on what we did, the way we look back on past ones, you know, and they're going to think and they're going to be right that certain things we did were so utterly irrational and stupid that it's going to be baffling how we managed to do them. Um, in my mind, there's no question that, you know, the drug war and criminalization schemes for drug users is going to be one of those policies, if not the main one, that future generations are going to look back on and, and be baffled about how we could have persisted in doing it for so long, given how, you know, just empirically baseless it is and, and how destructive it is for no good reason. Yeah, I, I, I largely agree with that. I'm perhaps a little bit more skeptical than you are of treatment programs, although I admit I don't know as much about the literature on them as you do. Uh, I think certainly this has been one of the worst and most destructive policies that we've pursued over the last several decades. Quite likely future generations will view it negatively. Indeed, even current opinion is beginning to uh, move in the direction of at least being uh, a lot more skeptical than it was before. Uh, the point you make about, well, if you're for legalizing this, you must be for using it. Uh, you know, obviously you're, you're right, it's, it, it doesn't necessarily follow, but I would note that sort of the social experience of drug use may be one of the things that has driven someone to change the opinion in that anybody who went to college in the last 40 or 50 years, including, of course, both of the last two presidents in the United States, uh, either used drugs themselves or has at least been around people who use them uh, and and went on to live reasonable, productive lives. So the sort of stereotype that we might have had in previous generations of, well, if you use drugs, that means you're going to become this drug-crazed fiend that is, you know, walking around with bloodshot eyes and beating people up or whatever. That's not a, uh, in, it's increasingly an image that most people no longer have in their heads. You know, they simply know too many people who tried marijuana or even tried harder drugs once or twice. But you know, it, uh, they didn't turn into these, you know, pathological socio, uh, sociopaths or whatnot. Uh, I'm not sure how much additional time we have. Uh, are we supposed to go for an hour? Yeah, and then... Uh, well? Yeah, I think we're, we're just a few minutes over our time. Um, so just let me add one quick point, which is just, yeah, just one quick point. Um, sure. Just to add, because we, we're just a little over our time. We can end. Um, very short, which is, you know, I think that's, that, that last point is interesting, and I do think that it, it's another analog to um, the, the issues of, of gay equality and the like as well. You know, 20, 30 years ago, lots of people um, didn't know anyone openly gay, and therefore fear-mongering tactics, stereotypes, and the like could fester because people didn't have personal experiences to compare it to and use it to debunk, and once more and more gay people started being openly gay and people, had, you know, knew that they, their neighbors were gay and their uncles were gay and the like, it became much harder to sustain these demonization campaigns. And I think you're absolutely right. The same is true in terms of the drug policy debate. You know, if, if, you've, if you've smoked marijuana in college or after or have friends who have used other forms of drugs and have had, and done so in controlled ways and have had led, led productive lives, it's much harder for these sort of fear-mongering scare tactics around drugs to take hold. You know, there's no um, antidote to, to fear-mongering like personal experience. And I think you're absolutely right. That's, that's a major factor as well. Last point on this, I think, is that if you legalize, that would make a wider range of drugs available. Uh, and as we know from the experience with alcohol, many people, given the choice, would try to use safer and less dangerous uh, and less severe drugs. Uh, so even to the extent the drug use uh, might rise a little or might remain the same, uh, the actual danger that that drug use poses to people's health and well-being might be less than in a situation where it's illegal uh, and where, therefore, people were, are more likely to choose harder drugs or more dangerous drugs or why not. Uh, I think you certainly see that with the experience with moonshine and the like during uh, alcohol prohibition, and I suspect that uh, we would see it with drug legalization as well, especially since there are actually some studies which suggest that when you have crackdowns on illegal drugs, that incentivizes drug dealers to substitute hard drugs for relatively less dangerous ones, uh, because if it's dangerous to smuggle uh, a certain quantity of drugs, you want to choose those which are um, uh, which give you more bang for the same buck, so to speak. Uh, and that incentive will be diminished, if not eliminated, with, with legalization. Yep, absolutely. We we definitely share um, lots of views on on.
on this end, and hopefully our, our optimism will prove to be warranted um, over the next few years. Uh, so I think we should probably leave it there. We had some Supreme Court issues that we had thought about discussing, but we probably don't have any time. We'll have to leave that for the sequel. Um, but I really enjoyed our discussion. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.